Hello, I'm Dan Marzu. I'm the Agricultural Educator for Lincoln and Marathon Counties UW Extension. Today I will be discussing the pesticide label. We usually take a look at the label when we're actually mixing or applying the pesticide. However, there are other times that we should be looking at the label, such as when we're selecting the pesticide. We need to find out if the particular pest or the crop are on the label so we can apply to it. And mixing and applying, you know, like I said before, very common. That's, that gives us information on how much water to put in, how much pesticide to put in, what uh, crop we need to spray it on, and what pest we need to spray it on. Also, storing. Storing is very important because it has very specific information on temperature, such as some pesticides you cannot have go below freezing. Other pesticides you can't store above 100 degrees. And also, disposing. The label has very specific information on what to do with the jugs or the bags after you're done using the pesticide or even the product itself on how to dispose of the product. It is your responsibility to read the label. If you do not understand the label, find someone that can explain it to you. The label is a federal document. It is federal law. Every pesticide label has this phrase on it, it is violation of federal law to use a product in a manner of inconsistent with its labeling. If you do something that is not on the label, it is called off-label, and it is illegal. Now let's take a look at the front page of the label. On the front page, there is various different identifying information on this. The first one is the trade name. This is the name that everybody knows the pesticide by. It's the one that's used by your dealer, your salesperson, and even by yourself to identify what the, what the pesticide is. The next is the active ingredient. This is usually located below the trade name and it contains what we call the common name. For example, in 7, the common name is carbaryl. Underneath the common name, if it has one, is the chemical name, which is usually in parentheses and has a long scientific name. Underneath that is what we call inert ingredients. Now, every company does not have to specify what inert ingredients, what the inert ingredients are. The inert ingredients are basically just other materials within the pesticide to make it work in order to control the certain pest. Also on the label, there are two different EPA numbers. The first one, the EPA registration number, is a specific number assigned to the, chemi to the pesticide itself. The next one, the EPA establishment number, specifies what state the product was manufactured in and the facility that it was manufactured in or repackaged in. It is important to actually write down the registration number just in case someone has a question on what kind of pesticide you used on the product or if there's any complaints such as drift or other situations that you might need to refer back to the EPA registration number. The EPA registration num uh, establishment number is not necessarily needed to be written down but is highly suggested just in case there is something wrong with the chemical pesticide that you need to send it back to the manufacturer. Also on the front page of the pesticide are signal words. Now the signal word actually specifies on how toxic the, chemi the pesticide is uh, to yourself. Caution is used when the pesticide is the least toxic or slightly toxic if inhaled, absorbed through the skin or get, or get into your eyes. Warning is moderately toxic. It's, it causes slight eye or skin irritation. Danger is used if it is highly toxic in one route of exposure. Route of exposures include through the skin, through the eyes, inhaled or ingested. Poison in red letters is added when the pesticide is highly toxic through all routes of exposure. Now the signal word for seven is caution. Next, let's find uh, the first aid information for seven. 
Every label has first aid information written on the label. This is very valuable in case you're out in the field or in your garden and you get exposed to the pesticide. It's usually in a box in the first couple pages of the label. For seven, if you get it on your skin or clothing, you need to take off your clothing immediately, rinse your skin immediately with water for 15 to 20 minutes, and call a poison control center or a doctor for treatment advice. The number for the poison control center in Wisconsin is listed here. Also, if cases are very severe, you might need to call 911. If you need to go to the physician's office, it is very important to bring the, the label with you. Most labels have an antidote statement or a note to the physician. This gives the doctor very specific information on what they need to do in order to treat the person that was exposed to the pesticide. To prevent exposure to the pesticide, every label has a section on personal protective equipment or PPE. The PPE statement actually lists all the equipment that you need to be wearing when you're applying the pesticide. For seven, you must be wearing long sleeve shirts, long pants, waterproof gloves, shoes plus socks, and a chemical resistant headgear if you're working overhead, such as if you're working on your boom and you need to be working above your head, or if it's in an irrigation system. Another part of the label lists all the environmental hazards of the pesticides. We use pesticides to help control unwanted pests but sometimes the pesticide will have some negative effects on some of the beneficial things that we want to keep into our field. So in seven, we have to be very cautious when we're spraying this around honeybees. Also, there are some surface water issues and some other uh, drift issues. So always look at this environmental hazard when you're, before you're spraying your pesticide. Next, let's do an example on how to determine what to apply to a certain pest in a certain crop. We want to control the tarnished plant bug and cabbage using seven. So first we have to go through all the label and find the crop. Sometimes it's in a table such as this with a crop heading. So we go down and we find cabbage. Sometimes the labels will actually break down the crops into certain families. In this case, cabbage is located in Nebraska leafy vegetable crops. Not all labels will use the same terminology. Sometimes they might just shorten it to brassicas. Other times they'll just put cabbage. Finding the insect is next. So we take a look at the pest column. Now we go down and we find that tarnished plant bug is on the label. So now we can use seven to control tarnished plant bug on cabbage. It is also very important to continue reading this. It, it, the label has very specific directions on how often you can spray the pesticide. So in this case, you can only spray a total of four times during the season and not often uh, not more than every seven days. So if you spray your pesticide on Tuesday, you cannot spray it before the following Tuesday. Next, the pesticide has some very specific restrictions and other precautions of spraying it on your crop. One that we look for is what we call the pre-harvest interval or the amount of time that you can spray the pesticide and then harvest the crop. In this case, we need to wait three days after applying seven in order to harvest the crop. So if you spray it on Wednesday, you must stop, wait until Saturday to harvest the crop. Next, it gives you a total amount of pesticide that you can spray throughout the season. Now remember, this is only throughout the season and not just one shot. So in this case, we do not want to apply more than four and a half fluid ounces per 1,000 square feet or six quarts per acre. Now that we know that we cannot spray 
we found out all about the specific directions and the restrictions, we take a look at how much we can spray per acre. So we take a look at the column where it says quarts of seven per acre, and we go down where we find that we can spray one to two quarts per acre, or three quarters to one and a half fluid ounces per 1,000 square feet. We'll be using the per 1,000 square feet in this example. So how much seven do you need to apply? Let's get through these. Our garden, is four feet by 100 feet. So, oops, yeah, just actually put back up here. First, we need to calculate the garden area. Our garden is four feet wide by 100 feet long. So, what we do is we take the four feet, multiply it by 100 feet, and we get 400 square feet. So the label says per 1,000 square feet. How much is that with our garden size? Well, it equates to about two and a half of our gardens. Or for your basketball fans out there, it's about the width of a basketball court all the way to the free throw line. So we found out that we need to have three quarters to one and a half fluid ounces per 1,000 square feet. We'll be using the one ounce rate. So one ounce is, is about two tablespoons for volume. So we take one ounce per 1,000 square feet, that's our rate, divided by 1,000 square feet to get the square foot rate, and we get 0 .001 ounces per square foot. Now we need to multiply that rate times our our area, which is 400 square feet, and we get 0.4 ounces needed to, con to cover the area sprayed. Now this might not necessarily be the amount that you put into the tank, it's just the amount that you need to cover your garden area. Here's a conversion chart to help you with other rates that you might find on other pes pesticide labels. So 16 ounces is equivalent to one pint. 32 ounces to two pints, which is equal to one quart. And 128 ounces is equal to eight pints, or four quarts, or one gallon. Now, if sometimes you don't want to use tablespoons, you can always go and purchase other measuring devices, such as this one, which will actually get you down to the half ounce rate, or the larger ones that can go from the one pint to actually one gallon sizes. Next, let's discuss the dry pesticide label. Now, reading the dry pesticide label is very similar to dry, reading the liquid label. However, measuring it is a little bit different. Dry pesticides are, have different particle sizes, which makes their volumes very different. So, look at the coffee creamer compared to the table salt way on the end. Both are four ounces, but they're very different volumes. So whether you're using a pull-behind sprayer or a backpack sprayer, it is always best to weigh the, the dry pesticide to get an accurate amount. Sometimes dry pesticides will come with their own containers. This is an example of four ounces and four different dry pe pesticides. There are all various differences. So you may not be able to use that same container to measure a different pesticide if it came with with one. Also, some labels actually have it broke down to tablespoons for you. In this case, uh, New Cop HB or fungicide actually has a label written in tablespoons per thousand square feet. So it is very important to read the full label before actually going and mixing your load. So let's take a look at an example. You want, to take, you want to control redwood pigweed and sweet corn using Lorox herbicide applied post-emergence. So we want to know if we can use Lorox. We take a look at, at the label and we find that redwood pigweed is on the label. In this case, 
It is not written in a table, but a list further on the label. Next, we take a further look into the label, and we notice that corn is written on there. However, it says field on it. Unfortunately, field corn is not the same as sweet corn, and we cannot use Lorax to spray onto the sweet corn field. So let's take a look at another example. We want to use uh, this herbicide to spray onto asparagus. So finding asparagus, we find that we can only apply four pounds of Lorax in, throughout the season or three applications per year. And for the pre-harvest interval, we can apply within one day of harvest. And we want to spray post-emergence. Now this means after the weeds are up. There's another part of the label that says pre-emergence, and that's usually before the weeds come up. In this case, we're looking at post-emergence, so we're able to make one to three applications of one to two pounds per acre before the weeds exceed four inches in height. This weed height is very important. If the weeds were a little bit taller, it may be harder to control the weeds in the in the asparagus plot. plot. So, determining the amount that we need to spray. We, we found out already that we can spray one to two pounds per acre. We decided to go on the higher rate and use two pounds per acre. We're going to use the same area that we used in the liquid example at 400 square feet. So how much Lorox DF do we need to cover our garden? First, we need to co convert the pounds to ounces. In one pound, there are 16 ounces. So we take two pounds per acre, multiply it by 16 ounces per pound, and we get the 32 ounces per acre. We want to then we want to convert acres to square feet. The size of an acre is equal to 43,560 square feet or about the size of a football field. So we take our 32 ounces that we need to spray out on our, on our field, divided by 43,560 square feet per acre, and we get 0 .0007 ounces per square foot. So now that we know how, much, how many ounces per square foot we need to apply, we take that, multiply it by our garden area, and we get 0.29 ounces of Lorox DF to cover the size of the garden. So how much water do you need to apply with the pesticide? It, well, it basically depends on whether you're using a, a sprayer or a backpack sprayer. You determine how much you want, need to have into the tank. It is always very important to calibrate your backpack sprayer or your pull behind sprayer in order to get the correct amount of water and the correct amount of pesticide into the tank. Sometimes pesticide labels have a chart and it actually says, in this case we're looking at vegetables, 20 gallons minimum per acre. Another example is they might be in a, in a paragraph. So, in this case, for post-emergence application of water, a minimum of 25 gallons per acre. Other labels might just say sufficient gallonage to obtain thorough and uniform coverage. So it really depends on what method you are using to apply your pesticides. The final thing I want to talk about is the supplemental label. Supplemental labels usually come in after the label has been published. They provide new information to an existing label. The supplemental label contains new pests or new crops. Sometimes a pesticide might be approved for a new pest that wasn't on the label and they need to release the supplemental label to make sure that the pesticide label is whole. There might be new use directions, whether they're brand new or a modification of the directions on the label, 
or other new instructions that weren't included in the, in the previous label. So with that, I thank you.